All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Marissa Adams. I'm going into my second year at the University of Rochester. Um, I also have an affiliation, a collaboration at uh, Sandia National Laboratories with my mentor there, uh, Stefan Slutz. Make sure you pronounce the name right. Um, so we work, he is essentially the creator of the maglif concept. It's a myth concept or a magneto inertial fusion concept, which is like a tie between uh, magnetic confinement fusion and ICF. Um, so what I mainly focus on is uh, during laser preheat, um, the laser deposition into our target here um, is non-uniform and there's potential for mix. Um, those of you who do like supernova explosions are probably really excited to see, you know, a set off shock occurring. So I essentially have boiled this down to a toy problem in flash where, you know, you can kind of see like half of your set off explosion occurring here. And this is what happens about 50 nanoseconds in. Um, the ambient density in here is 0 0.002 grams per cc. On the edge, it's higher density, 200 times more dense, simulating a DT ice layer. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so hello everyone, my name is uh, Paulo Alves, I work at Slack, I'm a postdoc at Slack, and uh, I'm interested in uh, the microphysics of plasmas and how they can impact the global dynamics of, of plasmas. And so in order to do so, I resort to uh, massively par parallel particle and cell simulations that are able to capture the fine microphysics of plasmas in large-scale domains. And uh, much of my work is focused on studying the, the stability of the microphysics of relativistic outflows, which are relevant in uh, relativistic astrophysical scenarios, in particular in relativistic shear flows. For instance, uh, I've found that these relativistic shear flows have very different um, behaviors if you, model, if you take into account the microphysics um, compared to MHD, if you model these things with MHD. So this has rich microphysics. Um, and so I've studied the ability of these instabilities to dissipate the kinetic energy of these shear flows, generate fields, accelerate particles, etc. Uh, a big, a big part. Uh, another important thing that I'm very interested in is in the. Well, I'm out. Sorry. <laughs> All right, my name is uh, Mark Avera. I work with Jonathan McKinney. I'm a graduate student at the University of Maryland, and uh, this is a um, fully 3D in curved space time simulation of a radiatively efficient thin disk in the magnetically arrested state. So the most strongly magnetized regions have the field lines threading it here, and you can see these large low density cavities that Sasha mentioned before. So <coughs> we've shown with a suite of these simulations, that a thin disk can actually advect large-scale flux into the mad state. We've shown that they could be as high as twice as efficient as you would expect for standard Shakura Sinai of thin disks. And uh, these simulations are with a branch of harm. Um, we are moving to include a better rate of transport, and there's an M1 closure scheme and a code now harm rad, which I will post to Slack is now public on GitHub, and I'll give a little uh, uh, description of an example that you could use to get started with it. Hello. Um, hi, I'm Pallavi Bhatt. I'm here at Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. Um, so I'm going to talk about the recent work we did. Uh, it, it's traditionally thought that MRI generates turbulence and then turbulence is responsible for the large-scale dynamo in the system. Here we show that uh, right in the MRI linear growth phase, uh, there is a large-scale dynamo action. Uh, there are fields growing at exponential rate. Um, here I show magnetic power spectrum, which I think is an important thing to look at in turbulence and dynamo studies. Um, from here, I plotted basically the components of field along different wave numbers, kx, ky, and kz. From this plot, we understand that um, there are these non-axisymmetric MRI modes which are responsible for the large-scale dynamo action. And um, eventually, 
the spectra broaden, uh, and this coincides with MRI uh, um, saturation. And um, all right, so that's what I have. Uh, so uh, large-scale dynamo precedes turbulence is what we. <laughs> Okay, I'm Elisabetta, and I'm interested in studying the, uh, sh the collision among uh, uh, in, uh, shocks. And this is a problem that is relevant for uh, astrophysics, but the physics behind the shock uh, collision is not fully understood. Uh, so we would like to propose, we propose a novel setup to study it in laboratory in laser-driven plasma, and we perform some uh, uh, explorative kinetic simulation uh, about it. And what our simulation shows is that we, we can launch two counterpropagating shocks, and uh, th they collide. And but after the collision, the shock velocity drop of about 70 percent. So we infer that the collision is inelastic. Moreover, we saw in the interaction zone that a strong magnetic field that before was not present uh, show up. So this uh, magnetic field, uh, so, uh, this mani we think that this magnetic field is, is uh, due to uh, viable instability because uh, the energy of the shocks go into preferential heating of the electron that uh, make the uh, electron distribution function anisotropic and this creates the viable instability. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I am Rajit Bose. Uh, I am at the University of Rochester. I'm doing my PhD uh, with Professor Ricardo Betty. And uh, what we are working on is inertial confinement fusion. So we have like multiple laser beams shining uniformly on a target, which is a, like a hollow shell. And uh, the size of this target, uh, in con contrast to astrophysics, is 600 microns, the radius, and we compress it 20 times to a much smaller core, and it's like an adiabatic compression, so the inside is hot, and it's confined by, a, uh, by the shell, which is cold and uh, high density. So this is a, this is a simulation uh, of, uh, and this shows one, like a quarter of this core, and uh, yeah, and uh, we, st we study the effects of hydro instabilities, Raleigh-Taylor, Rickmeyer-Meshkov, an onset of turbulence in ICF, and uh, yeah, using our code, which is uh, deck 2 d and it also has a 3D version. Yeah, if you are interested in ICF, you can talk to me. Uh, there is this awesome book, uh, which you could also see. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Gabriele Brambilla, and I'm a grad student at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in DC. Uh, these are pulsar done uh, with uh, peak code simulations. It's a field that uh, you heard uh, about this morning from Anatoly that started it some years uh, ago, two years ago. And uh, it's interesting because we can uh, follow the currents and the, in a consistent way without imposing any prescription to the particles. So all the non-idealities at which we are interested are safe. And uh, another interesting thing is that you can follow the different species, what they are doing. In this case, on the top, you see the contributions to the currents to the, from the electrons, and uh, on the bottom, the contribution that the positrons are giving. As you can see, it's very different for the two species. So it's a, a fun system to play with. So that's it. Less than one minute. <laughs> All right, hello, I'm Chad Bustard. I'm a second year grad student at University of Wisconsin working with Ellen Zweibel. And I am primarily interested in modeling galactic winds. So what we've done so far is we've developed a very versatile toy model of galactic outflows. And we've been trying to answer certain questions such as what can we say about the mass outflow rate, which outflows are the most efficient in expelling mass from the galaxy. Um, also the importance of radiative cooling and I'm also very interested in cosmic rays, so how cosmic rays and various treatments of cosmic rays affect outflow propagation. So if you are interested in any of those things, please read the paper that I've linked at the bottom, then email me at the email address I have at the bottom, 
or just come talk to me before the next 24 hours, I guess. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Yi Hao from also from University of Wisconsin Medicine. So what, what we have been studying is the interaction of the magnetized jet with the intracluster medium. So we are interested in how the different magnetic field structure in the jet will affect the large scale structure of the radio lobes. So you put in the jet, and then of course you can produce some like X-ray emissions, the X-ray cavities that we have seen in various sources. Furthermore. Uh, we have tracing particles that is not shown here, but we trace the cooling of the synchrotron spectra so that we can put um, synthesize realistic radio emissions at various frequencies. And if you go ahead, can go to the next slide. There's no next slide. There's no? No. What? Yes. <laughs> so this is a volume rendering image that I just made this week thanks, for the, thanks to the uh, tutorial there by Su Qing. Um, in the focus session. So this just shows the different uh, densities and this is just a reference of the Cygnus A. This looks like the same. <laughs> okay, so if you're interested, please talk to me. Thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Zhuo Chen. Uh, I'm working with Professor Adam Frank, Eric Blackman, Jason Nordhaus in University of Rochester. Today, uh, uh, we, consider, we started the formation of second binary disk and accretion disk in this research, and this uh, simulation uh, has uh, radiative transfer, radiative cooling, and uh, hydrodynamics, and it is, it's 3D. So, there is an AGB star and a set, uh, accreting companion in the simulation, and the AGB star is blowing winds into the uh, space, and uh, when the temperature dropped below the dust condensation temperature, there is dust form. When dust form, uh, it will significantly uh, increase the optical depth and opacity. So uh, the, the second stellar disk, second binary disk will gradually form. Uh, but, however, there is a bipolar outflow in the polar direction. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Atul Chotre, and I'm a graduate student at Oregon State University working with Davide Lizzati. So my primary research interests are relativistic jets in GRBs and AGNs, especially GRB prompt emission. And to study that, I perform Monte Carlo simulations and scattering dominated plasmas. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking two blobs of plasmas, basically electrons and photons, and making them interact by Compton scattering and pair processes, and trying to find out how the spectrum evolves for the photons and the lepton distribution evolves, and to see if any non-thermal features arise in the spectra, like these. And I'm building upon that very Monte Carlo code to add dynamics, that is, to incorporate photon propagation. And so I have a Compton scattering induced self-consistent evolution of a jet. And I can track four moment and positions of these particles, and so I can track the acceleration, the spectrum, and the light curves that are emitted by this jet. And here are these plots for the Lorentz factor proportional to R, and the temperature as it goes as the jet evolves, which varies inversely proportional to R. I'm also interested in AGN jets, spine sheet structured. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Please come talk to me if you're interested. Uh, my name is Matt Coleman. I study uh, outbursting white dwarf accretion disks. Um, one of the main reasons, th or there's two main reasons that these disks are really interesting to study. Um, because they're outbursting, they have time variability, and this really gives us a probe into the accretion disk physics that's going on in these systems. It lets us probe the stresses. And there's also a lot of observational evidence of these systems. So this is a real place where we can gain ground by comparing theory to observations. And uh, there's also just a lot of physics that just come out of these simulations, simulating this regime. Uh, one interesting thing is that we have an interplay between convection and MRI turbulence in some of these um, simulations. That's really interesting and it has a lot of phenomenology. 
So this is a standard butterfly diagram, except it's really weird because convection happens here, here, and here, but there's no convection there, so you get the repeating as muthal magnetic field. Hi, my name is Luca Comiso. I'm a postdoc uh, at Princeton University. I'm working on magnetic reconnection, and magnetic reconnection is defined uh, in a negative way, in the sense that you have to define the magnetic connections before defining magnetic reconnection. So, in the theorem that goes, um, that explains why field lines goes with the flow, it's very, it's known in plasma physics and goes under certain names like Lundquist theorem, Alphen theorem, sometimes connection theorem, and uh, here I'm going to just show that it's possible to generalize the theorem for relativistic plasma, but with non-ideal effects. One can have a magnetofluid tensor that takes into account the magnetic field, the velocity field, the current field, and can be affected by a, a kind of velocity that, take in, that preserves the connection uh, of, the, of the elements uh, in absence of relevant dissipation. Uh, this is an interesting idea that I wanted to share with you. <laughs> okay, I think that I've done it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Whedon. I'm from UNLRA and I also collaborate with Los Alamos. And I uh, majorly uh, use MIT simulation, study the magnetic energy dominated uh, models for both gamma ray bursts and the uh, blazers, such as the ECMAC model for gamma ray burst, which uh, considers a highly absorbed jets discreted into several shells. Uh, they collide, trigger fast turbulent reconnection, accelerate particles, and produce gamma ray burst. And also similar for TEV blazers, uh, fast flares. And I use a magnetic blob collision and the trigger reconnection, dump non-thermal particles, calculate uh, radiation and polarization simultaneously. I can well reproduce the 118 degrees polarization angle swing for blazer 3C279 and also the uh, 19 degrees pH change for one GRB case. And also the light curve is uh, roughly trace the uh, observation also. So this model looks like it proves, uh, or at least supports the high sigma models for uh, these systems. Thank you. I'm Andrea Drzinski. I'm at Columbia University. Um, one of the things that I work on is simulating the, the response of a circum binary gas disk to the merger of a black hole binary. So this is exciting for supermassive black hole binaries, which we expect to form in the mergers of massive galaxies. Um, and so if they merge, which is a whole other interesting story on its own, but if they merge, and if there's a gas disk around them, uh, the, the energy, energy emitted in gravitational waves during the final stages will produce an instantaneous change in the potential. So this will perturb the disk. Um, this is one example of many simulations of an axisymmetric simulation uh, where you see shocks produced that are propagating outward. Um, this is a response on human time scale, so it's exciting for electromagnetic counterparts to ELISA sources. Um, and please ask me if you want to know about other types of responses from different disks. No, that's the previous speaker. Go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I was wondering. <laughs> Hi everyone, my, uh, my name is Janos Stieberi. I'm a first year PhD student working with Henrik Ladder and Gordon Ogilvy at University of Cambridge. And I'm, I've been thinking about um, disco seismology and in particular trapped waves in magnetized black hole accretion disks. Uh, so one explanation that's been offered for the high frequency quasi-periodic oscillations that you see in um, X-ray binary observations is the confinement and amplification of uh, coherent global oscillation modes in the inner regions of uh, whoa. <laughs> uh, wow, I'm failing at this. Anyway, uh, in the inner regions of can 
black hole accretion disks. Um, there's been some question about whether or not these uh, modes survive in the presence of magnetic fields and MHD turbulence. So I've been taking another look at this problem through a semi-analytical model that I am hoping to extend to uh, nonlinear simulations run using either Ramses or after listening to Jim Stone, maybe Athena++. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, let me know. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Drummond Fielding, I'm a, uh, would you make it full screen? <laughs> Alright, yeah, so I'm a grad student at UC Berkeley, I work with Elliot Quadert and generally I work on um, galactic winds, so I sort of didn't want to put any quantitative plots and just show you two pretty pictures, I work both on how the winds are launched by actually resolving, or well, trying to understand if supernovae are able to launch a wind, really. So we have super high resolution and looking at how the uh, collective effect of many supernovae launch a wind. And then also, zooming out much farther, you can see this is like a 4 kpc box, this is a 300 kpc box, and looking at how the winds affect the structure of the CGM, which is already has a lot of really rich dynamics in it with like things Elliot talked about with HBI and MTI and thermal instability. And uh, yeah, that's all. Hi, I'm Yuli Fuji at Niels Bohr Institute, Denmark. I'm working on M MRI in protoplanetary disks. So protoplanetary disks are weakly ionized, so we need to consider non-ideal MHD. So I'm calculating uh, this chemical equation. Like I'm solving rate equation with MHD to see the non-ideal MHD effect, and, uh, and I'm doing this time dependently. Um, this is one of my plot. Um, uh, the non-equilibrium result is uh, slightly, is, uh, this is ionization degree, and ionization degree with non-equilibrium chemistry is slightly lower than the equilibrium value. So maybe it's worth doing chemistry with time, uh, time evolution. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Alexei Gnorozov. I'm a graduate student at Columbia working with Brian Metzger. One project I've worked on is on jetted tidal disruption events. Uh, so there's this really interesting transient w detected in 2011 by the SWIFT satellite called SWIFT 1644. So it produced a lot of emission hard x-rays and uh, synchrotron uh, radio. Um, it's really bright. Now you can look at uh, other tidal disruption candidates. So these are candidates for stars being disrupted by supermassive black hole detected in optical UV and soft X-ray. And there you don't detect any radio emission. Um, so this suggests perhaps that in these systems you don't have uh, jets nearly as powerful as, as SWIFT 1644 uh, or perhaps no jets at all. Uh, in a recent paper we looked into how the uh, radio emission from jets would vary uh, across a wide range of ambient gas densities. Hi, my name is uh, Raman Deep Gill. I'm a postdoc at the Open University of Israel, and uh, I'm interested in the understanding of uh, dynamical evolution of, and dissipation mechanism radiation transfer in high magnetization jets, basically the whole uh, global picture of what goes on in GRB jets. And to that end, I've tried to piece together the, how the prompt emission is formed, and uh, this is a time development uh, using my one uh, zone kinetic code, uh, nu of nu of the spectrum. And over the past few days, I've been playing around with some of the tools showcased in this conference uh, workshop, uh, namely Athena 4.2 and YT, to study the cross cross short shell instability, and this is some of the results, uh, very preliminary, uh, results that I'm showing you here. Uh, it's, oh, okay, I have time. So it's an instability where uh, if you have a striped wind, you have uh, 
uh, oppositely oriented magnetic field lines with hot plasma stuck in between and an effective gravity field in the frame of the jet. And uh, slowly the pl plasma drips out. So uh, the, the field is in, into the board and the plasma, is, I think it's starting to drip out and the field lines will then reconnect. So that will accelerate the jet. So this is the, a very preliminary work. Thanks. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Goldstein. I'm a graduate student at UW-Madison working with Ellen Zweibel and Rich Townsend. We're interested in exploring how uh, instabilities redistribute angular momentum in stars. Uh, we're currently looking at the Taylor instability where uh, a stack of toroidal magnetic fields under the influence of gravity in MHD equilibrium becomes unstable um, given the right criterion. And that criterion is that an adiabatic perturbation causes work that's negative. Uh, this is a function of the same variables that's in the MHD equilibrium. But we're interested in long time scales over the life of the star. So we re-derive this criterion uh, in the analastic approximation, which filters out small density perturbations responsible for relatively fast sound waves. Um, in that case, the continuity equation is reduced to this, and the criterion condition gets an additional term. We then use gyre, which is an oscillation code, to numerically solve uh, the MHD, the analastic MHD equations for the number of unstable modes uh, for various uh, MHD, sorry, for various equilibrium conditions. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Gohl. Um, I'm a grad student at the University of Colorado working with Phil Armitage and Jake Simon. Um, I'm generally interested in protoplanetary disks and specifically have been looking at uh, ones with dead zones. So dead zone happens when the disk is not thermally ionized. The outer layers stay ionized from radiation, but at the midplane you get a bunch of very, very neutral gas. The resistivity there is high enough that the uh, MRI is actually damped before it can start up, so you get an MRI active outer layer and no MRI at the midplane. So throw this into a shearing box, and we particularly want to study how the layers interact. There's a lot of interesting things that goes on, um, but one question we kind of asked is how much of this turbulence is able to actually trickle down to the midplane in the dead zone? How dead is the dead zone? Um, so one result I'm showing here, this is the accretion rate, which is related to the level of turbulence. Uh, this top case is for a small dead zone versus the bottom one's for a large dead zone. So a small dead zone is kind of easier to excite and you actually get a little bit of turbulence and some mass accretion through the small dead zone. But if you have a large dead zone, it's more dead. Um, I recycled my department slide. <laughs> so, I'm Mulan Gong. Don't confuse me with the Disney character Mulan. We're both from China, but we have a different character. Uh, I'm a fourth year graduate student here in Princeton, and I'm now working with Eva Stryker on star formation simulations. Uh, Eve talked about some of my work on IMF and core mass function, and now I'm also working on chemistry and adding chemistry to the Athena++ code that Jim and other people developed here in Princeton. So with chemistry, hopefully we'll be able to have realistic heating and cooling and also uh, bridge the gap between observation and theory by simulating the chemical species. So if you're interested in star formation or chemistry, come and talk to me, I'm always here. And I might spend a lot of time, I like doing outreach, I like going rock climbing. So I'm happy to meet you, uh, some of you here, doing observing and climbing, and hope to see you again in the near future. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Dominik Grankiewicz and I come to you from Poland, from Nikolaus Copernicus Astronomical Center. So, what? <laughs> So, oh, I don't need it, no. Why would I need a pointer, come on? 
Um, so my main interests are accretion disk and in particular this uh, interface between the hot corona in accretion disk and the cold phase. Because we think that this processes in this layer could, expect, uh, could explain some of the spectral features that we see in X-ray spectra of the AGNs. Apart from my main PhD uh, research, I also do uh, a very hipster branch which is light pollution modeling and which not many people do. Uh, apart from science, I'm also an amateur astronomer and I highly, uh, I participate in uh, outreach uh, with great pleasure. I have my own telescope. So in case you want to go to stargazing and you happen to be in Central Europe, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris Heron from the University of Sydney, and I look at new ways of analyzing observations of polarized synchrotron emission. So if we just ignored the polarization and looked at the total intensity of synchrotron emission, then we can see supernova remnants and star-forming regions, but these images are very difficult to analyze if you want to learn more about turbulence in the warm, diffuse, ionized gas in these areas. And so it turns out that if we calculate the gradient of the polarization, and this reveals all these turbulent structures that are just otherwise invisible in the warm ionized gas. And as a bonus, it's also immune to some observational artifacts. So in my work, I introduce and try to derive some new quantities that are similar to the polarization gradient and compare them between observations and simulations. And so the overall goal is to try and come up with new ways of visualizing and qualitatively studying MHD turbulence and also to come up with ways of calculating the sonic and alphanic Mach numbers in these areas. Thank you. All right, I'm Miguel. I'm a grad student at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and I have several uh, collaborations and I decided to just talk about uh, one of the more, re more recent ones that I've started to get involved with, uh, laboratory astrophysics with relativistic pair plasmas. So essentially understanding the microphysics relevant to high energy environments like gamma ray bursts. So current experiments are working on getting the proper scalings, but in the future we may have something like uh, this prototype here where you laze targets with an ultra intense laser, form a relativistic jet and form shocks. Um, if you want to know more about this, uh, you can talk to me, or if you also want to know uh, more about these topics, you can also talk to me about that as well. So, thank you. Okay, so hello everyone, I'm Su Qing from UCSB. So I'm mainly interested in how our big picture about galaxies and galaxy clusters can be significantly modified by the multiple physical processes such as turbulence, magnetic fields, shocks, and instabilities, and so on. And I mainly use local non-cosmological simulations in my research. So in the left panel, I show when a, sh uh, when a shock propagates inside the me turbulent medium, how the B fields can be amplified by the shock. So this can help us to understand how the geometry and the strengths of B fields can form in supernova remnants and other curves of ICM. And in the right panel, I show the simulation of the formation of cold gas filaments in galaxy halo. And we found that initially triggered by some instability, this kind of cold filamentary structure can be greatly enhanced by the presence of magnetic field. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Emily Lichko. I'm at the University of Wisconsin working with Yen Egedal. Um, and I work on basic plasma physics, but right now we're working on a model of um, magnetic pumping as a source of um, heating in the solar wind. Um, so electrons originating from the corona, we'd expect them to cool really quickly as, because of the expansion of the solar wind as they move away from the sun, but they don't. Um, so Elliot Qua 
quarter, quarter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, talked a little bit about this at the end of his talk. Um, and so there are a bunch of different models. Um, and the one I'm looking at looks at the, takes the drift kinetic equation um, and uh, basically does a bunch of math. Ooh. Um, and we find that we get uh, power law distributions, which we'd expect. Um, <laughs> and uh, so there, a lot of the models are um, turbulent, and so as opposed to those models, our model has energy injection at the highest scales, so we bypass the cascade. Um, if you want to talk to, about the solar wind, let me know. <laughs> okay. So I'm Miao from Colombia. So I work on supernova-driven outflows where I. Okay, so we simulate a patch of uh, a galaxy disk and it explodes supernova near the middle plane here. Oh, okay. Here, and then study the interstellar medium and outflows. So here I want to emphasize the two very different uh, interstellar medium thermal state. One is the thermal runaway and the thermal equilibrium. So here the temperature slides show the difference. Hot is red and blue is cold. So for the thermal runaway, the supernova remnants uh, overlap and the most of the volume is hot. For the thermal runaway, uh, for the equilibrium, most of the volume is cold and supernova lose most of their energy by cooling. So thermal runaway or not depend on two competing powers, the supernova density versus the SM pressure include all component. It may seem simple, but actually it's not because the two competing components are not completely independent. For example, so, uh, cosmic rays are from supernova. And we care about the thermal runaway or not because they are very different. The wind loading factor um, differ by a factor of 10. The cosmic ray uh, propagation is a different mode and the photo escape fraction is very different. So this is a very exciting uh, field. So young students should come join us. Thanks. Uh, I am probably the only one who doesn't, doesn't do any numerical simulations. So I'm doing, uh, doing uh, some analytical calculation on tidal disruption events. They, once a star gets disrupted by a supermassive black hole, the, a huge amount of radiation energy in, term, in the form of UV and optical gets released into the interstellar medium. By the way, this is the Milky Way Center. Uh, so I consider the fate of this radiation. Uh, it turns out those, most of the radiation gets absorbed by the dust, circumnuclear dust, and it produces a bright infrared signal. And this has been confirmed after, a month after I published my paper. And this opens a new window because no one has taken a look at in the uh, NTD using the infrared before. Uh, in the future, we'll have lots of observations. Thank you. Howdy, uh, I'm Daniel Murray and I work with Phil Chang at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, I mostly work on AMR uh, simulations of turbulent, massive turbulent uh, star formation. Sort of a quick little postage stamp is up there in the upper right. A couple of our cool results is the green line here is the turbulent velocity, the blue line is the infall velocity and the red dashed line is what the free fall velocity would be like. You can see the uh, green line just sort of decreases as you come inwards to decreasing radii. This is expected from Larson's law are the deviations from it. However, interestingly, it flattens out and then actually turns around and tends to follow the uh, blue infall velocity in. Also note the fact that the uh, <coughs> blue line always remains below the uh, free fall velocity. It tells us that there is an effective pressure here which is actually being provided by the turbulence and that is slowing down the uh, collapse for star formation. Uh, other than that, the only other piece is the fact that at no point in time in the star formation do we see uh, inside out. We entirely see outside in, in uh, direct opposition to what Shu's analytic solution that we learned about yesterday. Thank you. Hi, so I want to talk about the origin of fast and slow rotating elliptical galaxies. Um, so some very clever people made the illustrious simulation, and in it they find galaxies like this. This is line of sight velocity, and you can see it's clearly spinning. 
and galaxies like this, which are a mess. This is a fast rotator, and this is a slow rotator. And we see these kind of galaxies in the universe around us, but their formation history is still quite uncertain. Um, here we have tens of thousands of galaxies from the simulation, and looking at their spin and their average properties. And I'm going to tell you their story. So all elliptical galaxies start out as fast rotators with low mass. Uh, they have collisions, and most of those collisions tend to disrupt their spin. What we found is that if they have a lot of gas, that spin is quickly recovered. If they don't have much gas, it's slow to recover. The larger a galaxy gets, the more massive, the more gas it expels, and the more frequently it collides. And eventually, the merger rate is faster than the rate it can recover, and you get a slow rotating galaxy. And that's me. And if anyone can explain this cleverly, let me know. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm studying gaps in the black hole magnetospheres, and as you know from the uh, harm work session, it is continuous washing out of the plasma from the black uh, from the black hole magnetosphere, so it's going away from the black hole and down to the, the uh, down to the black hole. This means that we have the region with the lack of plasma and this region is called the gap. And we are interested in this gap. And it happens so that this gap could be quite large of the order of the size of the horizon. So we can't just neglect this gap if we want to understand the structure of the black hole magnetosphere. And even if you don't care about the black hole magnetosphere structure, it is all, the gap is also important uh, because one of the hot topics now in high energy physics, it is the fast variability of the gamma radiation coming from the active galaxy nucleus, and the fast variability means that the size of the emission region could be quite small, and what it could be, it could be the gap. And also it could be the source of the cosmic rays, so we still don't know what are the sources uh, of the ultra-high energy cosmic rays and uh, the source of high energy neutrino. And what are we doing? We are doing Monte Carlo simulations of the particle acceleration in the gap, taking account the uh, spectrum of the background radiation. And uh, here are some results of the spectrum that we could observe, and there is comparison to the M87 spectrum, and that's it. Uh, I'm working on transient growth of linear perturbations in disks. Even in linearly stable flows, some kind of perturbations can demonstrate significant growth of amplitude. And how is it possible? What is physical mechanism of this growth? How to calculate amplification factor? And what is the mathematical basis of such calculations? If you want to know answers, read my last paper and references therein. Goodbye. Okay, uh, hello, my name is Teho Du. Uh, I'm a graduate student at Stanford University in New York. Uh, these are my collaborators. Uh, Roger Bapona is my advisor, and I'm also working with Takamichi Tanaka, who is an associate professor. Um, these are my collaborators that I'm working, working with on current projects. So basically, I'm trying to understand the formation of the black holes from the early universe to the local universe and the dynamics in the stellar cluster using n-body simulation. Um, so these are the previous res research and these are ongoing projects. So pay attention to the red, yellow box. These are the keywords about my um, research area. So, um, so I, I consider this presentation as just kind of successful one if you can remember any of these keywords at the end of the day. And if you are interested in any of this uh, research area, then I'm really happy to talk with you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Yuya Sakurai from University of Tokyo. Uh, 
Uh, I study about supermassive black hole formation in the early universe. And uh, one of my research is about uh, supermassive star formation uh, with a high accretion rate. And uh, supermassive star, star forms uh, from a small, small star with a accretion rate about this. Um, in the uh, constant accretion rate, uh, feedback does not occur and the star can and grow to 10 to 4 solar mass. But in a realistic case, uh, episodic accretion can occur. So I examined does, uh, whether feedback occurs in this case. And uh, I, I conduct to the hydrodynamic simulation to obtain episodic accretion and con then conduct the evolution calculation and showed UV emissivity is very low and no feedback expected. And uh, <laughs> The star grows to larger than 10 to 4 solar mass, and this star can uh, gravitationally collapse to supermassive black hole cells in the early universe. Uh, that's all. Hello everyone, I'm Amit and I'm interested in cosmic rays in intermittent magnetic field. So if you take a velocity flow and solve induction equation, you end up with this intermittent magnetic field, by which I mean localized strong packets of uh, magnetic field. Now if you take this field, do a Fourier transform, and add a random phase to it, and then take an inverse Fourier transform, you end up killing the structure, but the uh, power spectrum is still the same for both fields. Uh, so then I solve Lorentz force equation and calculate diffusion coefficient in this and this field. This plot shows ratio of diffusion coefficient calculated in the uh, intermittent field uh, to, uh, to diffusion coefficient calculated in this randomized phase field. And you see that the ratio is greater than one for low energy particles and for high energy particles it is almost same. So we conclude that the magnetic structures enhances cosmic ray diffusion and we interpret these results in terms of correlated random walk instead of usual Brownian motion. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Maria Vranic, I come from Lisbon, Portugal, and I study plasmas in, at extreme intensities. So one, one way how to uh, achieve very extreme conditions in the lab is to use uh, intense laser pulses, and you can play now. <laughs> so um, this, is, uh, this is achieved in modern laser facilities, and uh, I'm going to show you here uh, one example. So we have four lasers that are focused on this uh, nanowire and uh, we will show the electric field uh, that, that is uh, here a standing wave and plasma that is self-created. So it's electron positron pairs and rising density can be seen here uh, in a, uh, as a, vol as a this surface plot. So once the surface goes above this plane where we show the fields, it has reached relativistic critical density, it, it actually disrupts the field. So, um, yeah, so you can produce this type of setups in the lab and we will be able to see this effect in next generation laser facilities. Thank you. Hello, I'm Justin Walker. I'm a graduate student at University of Wisconsin-Madison. I work with Stanislav Boldarev. And we are looking at MRI-driven turbulence and seeing how it compares to standard MHD-driven um, turbulence where you have some prescribed forcing field. So how we do that is we have incompressible resistive MHD equations that we solve using uh, Geoffroy Lesueur's code Snoopy. And we performed a direct numerical simulation with high resolution. And you can see some of the results up here. So this is a volume rendering of one of the fields. This is a cross-section perpendicular to the uh, weak ma uh, applied magnetic field. And one of the main results that we found is, as, we, as we've looked at this, it looks more and more like 
standard MHD turbulence. And so one of the main results is if we assume that this strong field that is amplified from the the weak field that you weak seed field, if you assume this as some sort of guide field like in standard MHD turbulence, and you look at the spectra perpendicular, you find something which matches MHD turbulence. All right, thank you. Hi, I'm Josh Wall, and I'm working with uh, Steve McMillan, Mordecai Mecklo, kind of a motley crew up here, actually. And we're trying to extend the stellar feedback uh, model in both directions, so we want to go up by starting with uh, simulations that are 40 kiloparsec in Z, kiloparsec, kiloparsec in X and Y, that have uh, ongoing supernova feedback that's happening live. And then we collapse these clouds, this is a 10 to the 4 solar mass cloud, and actually form stars and do in-body collisional dynamics. So we also get go down on the other scale, such that we can form binaries and triples and they have interactions. And at the same time, we do radiative feedback, stellar winds, and supernova feedback all at once. So these are all tests from my actual code that I've been working on. Uh, and we also intend to do a single and binary evolution, including binary accretion. So a pretty complex problem, but we think we need all these physics to really uh, find out how the feedback essentially works and uh, how star formation affects the things happening around it. So thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Gandhari from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Here is an image of galaxy M87, and we can see a shock and a pair of bubbles here. And we also see a vortex ring here, which is an indication of a shock bubble interaction. So this motivates us to study this further using the flash code. So the first part of my study was to set up a uh, simulation to complement experiments done at the Wisconsin Shock Tube Laboratory. The experiment consists of two bubbles which are hit by a shock wave traveling downwards. And we see the formation of two vortex rings, which we also see in our simulations. The next part was to look at the impact of magnetic fields. So we took a bubble and we put tangled magnetic fields inside. And we find that after the passage of the shock, again a vortex ring is formed with the magnetic field lines frozen in. Another setup that we tried was to have uh, external field draping the bubbles. And in this case, we find that the bubble splits into two thin tubes. So what we find is that the impact of the magnetization is strongly impacted by the topology of the magnetic field. So if you have any questions, talk to me and scan the QR code for a movie. Hi, my name is Rainer Weinberger. I'm working at the Heidelberg Institute for Theoretical Studies with Volker Springer on cosmological simulations. And the way this is done, or this works, is you essentially set up a almost uniform um, box uh, filled with gas and um, collisionless dark matter particles and evolve them uh, through essentially the whole uh, lifetime of the universe. And what you get in dark matter is a filamentary structure, and in this filamentary structure, um, gas falls in and forms uh, so-called halos, which then cool down radiatively and form uh, stars and thus form galaxies. In these biggest halos, you see then um, galaxy clusters, and here is a simulation output of a massive elliptical galaxy of such a galaxy cluster. In these smaller uh, intersections, you form things like the Milky Way or uh, similar things. So what is my work in this whole project is uh, mainly studying the effect of uh, supermassive black holes and AGN jets uh, on this formation process and trying to make sense uh, of small scale simulations in this large context. Thank you. I'm Ben Wibking. I'm a graduate student in astronomy at, at Ohio State. Uh, I'm working on radiation pressure driven galactic winds. Uh, you can read the slide in the GitHub for the technical details, but I'll explain to everyone who doesn't work on galactic winds why you should care. Um, so as Eve explained in her lecture, um, <clears throat> we don't know what the most important feedback processes are. We don't know possibly what all of the feedback processes are that regulate star formation. And we don't know what generates high velocity 
cold molecular outflows from galaxies as well. So one possible mechanism is radiation pressure on, uh, on dust. So the direct UV radiation from massive stars uh, has a very high dust absorption opacity, and that turns out will drive super supersonic turbulence, um, which is what I found in my 2D simulations with Athena and with my, my transport code. So turbulent driving, uh, very possible directly from, from an instability. Uh, and as Eve also talked about in her simulations, I find the low column density sight lines are accelerated more um, than, than higher density column sight lines. So feel free to ask me about this if you'd like. Thanks. Hello, I'm Ray, a first year grad student here in Princeton. Uh, this is a project I did with Professor Matt Kunz. As you already know from Elliot's talk last week, uh, in MHD theory, a magnetized weakly collisional plasma is convectively unstable due to uh, to the magnetothermal instability due to anisotropic heat conduction. However, in collisional systems, such as the outskirts of galaxy clusters, fluids model is not appropriate. That's why we did uh, linear kinetic calculations. And we find uh, kinetic counterparts of, of MTI, MTI that has similar growth rate. Uh, but the heat, heat transport in collisional case is, is due to the particles streaming along the fuel lines rather than particle collisions. More importantly, at sub ion Lamo scale, there's a new instability driven by electron temperature gradient that we call electron MTI. It has larger growth rate than normal MTI, which implies a large structure of MTI depends on the saturation of electron MTI. Of course, all these results need to be tested by future numerical simulations. If you are interested, talk to me. Thank you. I'm Vladimir. I flew down here from Colorado, and this is one of the projects that I'm working on, uh, turbulence and non-thermal particle acceleration in simulations of relativistic turbulence uh, and collisionless plasmas, in particular with plasmas with uh, relativistic temperatures, such as for pulsar wind nebulae, uh, jets, and also accretion flows. Uh, this is an uh, ill-advised three-dimensional rendering of my simulation, uh, which I think I could improve on after this school. Uh, but we do get some nice results in the simulations. Shown here is an energy spectrum, which is compensated, and it shows a nice inertial range. And this is kind of nice because these are particle and cell simulations, so it's very difficult to reproduce the MHD scales. And then we also see non-thermal particle distributions, which are power laws, and they're very reminiscent of what one would see in magnetic reconnection. So we're trying to understand the connection between turbulence and magnetic reconnection uh, in more detail. Hi, uh, my name is Yao. I'm a graduate student uh, at the P Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. So what I'm showing here in the figure is just a simple numerical test problem. On the left, uh, it's called the coalescence instability. It's an ideal MHD instability. On the left-hand side, I'm showing an e initial equilibrium that is unstable to the attraction between the flux tubes with the same current. So, but you're welcome to run this test problem with your own ideal MHD code, remember to turn the resistivity off, but still you'll most, li you'll most li likely get, uh, mer get what an artifact called the numerical reconnection and uh, the flux tubes will just merge. But here I'm showing that with my code, with my method, I can get you these property, get you these, uh, these equilibriums with these pentagonal or hexagonal states. Uh, so how did I cheat? Uh, it turns out the punchline is, if you want to avoid errors, just don't solve the equation. Uh, right, so it turns out if you go to the Lagrangian labeling, right, just, yeah, here. That was it, I think, right? Are you going to one missing. Who, one missing? Well, no, 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 we're not done yet. Is there anybody in the audience who hasn't given a talk would like to come up here? 
Nobody? Nobody is having second thoughts on not having given a lightning talk? Then I have to do my 30 seconds. Where am I? Ah. All right, so um, I was going to say a few words on, on two things that I've done. One of them is rather historic, because I was a postdoc here in 1986, and with working with Pete Hutt and Josh Barnes, who had just published a paper on the tree code, and they were interested in um, developing a, a package, a Unix package, using pipes and standard programs wrapped around in C, uh, so you could pipe them and doing the tree code, but lots of other interesting things. Um, if I can get this thing working. Um, and body snapshots, we could compute orbits in them and, and, and take orbits as an object, recompute images from them, tables, and all of these produce an environment that is very rich in which you can do all kinds of simulations, real and fake, dynamic uh, and body codes and so forth. I showed one graph earlier in the week that was created using Nemo. There's some scripts in there. The other package that I'm working on is more observational based and is using Python. It's a, a package, a toolkit that uses CASA, which is a package that everybody who gets all my data has to use. But it's a little bit difficult to use, so we wrote a package that helps the user getting these big data cubes and deciphering scientific information out of it, these science data products. It takes the cubes and, for example, if you take a slice through a cube... <laughs> right. If you take a slice through this cube, you get to see, as a function of position and velocity, lots of molecular lines in this galaxy. Each slither that you see is roughly a rotation curve. So what you get out of this is lots of these line cubes, each for a different molecule. You, f you get moment maps out of this and so forth. And that's de delivered directly to the user. This package is called Admit, and it will be available for the user in August or September, but it's already downloadable uh, through GitHub. Uh, that's my contribution for today. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for uh, fantastic lightning talks. All the talks, I know I had to cut them off. I had to be fair to the others. All of the talks are available as, M as PDFs in your GitHub, so you can read them in a little bit more detail. Thanks very much. That's the end of today.